examples of husband wife who are like really connected as one. You, you, you see them, they've gone, most of the time those are couples who have gone through great difficulties or struggles, and you, you see them walking side by side yet. And, and, and you watch them, you're just encouraged by how they are as husband and wife, and, and then you look back and go, wow, I still have a long ways to go. You have some of those examples in your mind, in your heart? I've said this one before, but it is still extremely powerful. It was my grandpa and grandma de Rol, my mom's parents. They'd been married for 73 years when grandpa had a stroke. He was in, they were living in assisted living. And one day Jane and I, and with my mom and dad, went up to visit grandpa and grandma in Glenwood, Minnesota. And we got to grandma's apartment in assisted living and, and she was waiting for us already. And it was strange not having, it was like the first time not having grandpa with her. And grandpa was in another part of the building of the nursing home. And so we got there, we said hi, we got our hugs, and he said, it's time to go see Pa. And so we started walking, grandma had the shuffle, and we, we walked through the corridor, and we went around another corridor, and we went another corner, and, we, and then finally we came to a hallway of doors. And as we were shuffling down towards the door, a nurse came out of the room and said, Oh, Carrie, Henry's been waiting for you. He's been very agitated this morning. We can't calm him down. And uh, so is there anything? We're, we're just sorry he, we can't figure it out. So we, we get in the room, and there is Grandpa laying in, in the bed. And you can tell he's that, that agitated and just keeps moving. And it is, it's like we no longer existed. And Grandma grabbed a chair and said, Pa, I'm here. Pa, I'm here. And she sat right next to him, grabbed his hand, and put her other hand on it and said, Pa, I'm here. Pa, I'm here. Carmen and Don are here. So is Todd and Jane. Pa, I'm, I'm here. And within about a minute, he was calm. She never let go of his hand the whole time. And when we left, she stayed in the room. I got a long ways to go. That was a couple that were made one flesh. Body, spirit, soul, emotion, you name it. It was, they were one. And I've found it amazing that in each place where we've, uh, we've gone, there, has, there have always been couples like that that have shown us what it means to be one. In Galesburg, I remember the Petersons after a tragic accident of a young couple leaving her extremely brain damaged. And he raising two young kids by her, by her side for years and years and years. For the Davis family, in which she, having severe rheumatoid arthritis and almost in, totally incapacitated, her husband took care of her. And when she had to go to the hospital, he had to take care of her. He had to, because the nurses were too rough with her, they just didn't know how to handle her. And he would carry her wherever she needed to go. I remember the, the Dister Hops as Alzheimer's stepped in and she taking care of her husband and here too. We got to watch Sterling take care of his wife. You have those examples of the two becoming one in an amazing, powerful way that encourage you. They're like, wow, wow. And then you go, I don't know if I could do that. Have you ever said that? I don't know if I could have done, I can do that. And yet you encourage, say, I want to do that. 
I want to do that. That is very powerful, becoming one. One with your spouse and one with the Lord. It is an amazing bond. And today as we come toward the end of our, our study in the Song of Songs, we have watched this husband and wife come from a place where she's, from not, she's coming from the outside, coming in, and, and she wants to stay where she's at, and he keeps coming to her and inviting her to come with him and, and, and to a, into this relationship, to come in him with a new home. And, and there's been opportunities for her to, um, to get away, trying to get away and enjoy what was once, but she is always called back to be alongside of him. And in this last moments, we see them becoming one. So we're looking at from chapter 7, verse 11, and if we can, we're going to try to make it all the way through the book. Okay, so that's chapter and a half. Um, we're going to try to motor. Sorry about that. But it's becoming one. And so if you have your Bibles, you can. I do not have, the, I do not have it up on the screen but we're going to take it in sections. So, Song of Songs or Song of Solomon. So if you open the middle of your Bible, you'll get to Psalms, and then you keep going to the right. You'll get Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Song. If you hit Isaiah and Jeremiah, you've gone too far. Now you've got to go left. We're going to do this first section, starting at verse 11. Come, my beloved, let's go out into the fields and lodge in the villages. Let us go out early in the vineyards and see whether the vines have budded, whether the grape blossoms have opened and the pomegranates are in bloom. There I will give you my love. The mandrakes give forth fragrance, and beside our doors are all choice fruits, new as well as old, which I have laid up for you, O oh my beloved. Oh, that you were like a brother to me who nursed me, uh, nursed at my mother's breasts. If I found you outside, I would kiss you, and none would despise me. I would lead you and bring you into the house of my mother, who, she who used to teach me. I would give you spiced wine to drink, the juice of my pomegranate. His left hand is under my head, and his right hand embraces me. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, that you do not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. In this section, there is kind of like two different thoughts are going on. And, and so first is the invitation to get away. She initiates it. And so there are two things, ideas of probably with this. That she's going, she is telling her, let's get out of Dodge. You ever wanted to get out of Dodge? Yeah? Let's go, he says. Let's, she says, let's go. Let's go out in the village. Let's go out in the village. Let's go get away someplace. And someplace with not concrete. Let's go out to the vineyards. Let's go out in the country with vines, the blossoms, the pomegranates. And let's just, just get away the two of us. It is also an invitation for she wants to be intimate with him. Let's get out of here. I say, how do you know that? Well, the, again, vineyards and so whatever is like the woman's body in some sense, but it's more towards the mandrakes. Mandrakes was kind of known as that fragrance that caused sexual arousal and, and, and fertility. And so she's really saying, let's, let's get out. Let's get away and just have the two of us. No kids. No parents. No friends. Let's just be the two of us to be together. Sense of, I'll give you choice fruits, new as old. Um, how many of you like, I, I don't think she's talking plums here or plums and prunes, like it's old or new. It, it's, it's more that encompassing saying, I'm going to give my total being to you. It's kind of like it's the, the, the sun and the earth, all of creation, or it's from uh, D.C. to California. It covers all the U.S. So she's saying, I want to give you my whole being. It is that step of, I am totally yours. 
And so the first part there says, let's, let's get away. The second part is PDA, public display of affection issues. We don't know what's going on, but in eight through four, she's saying it's kind of inappropriate for us to be together. They're, they're not saying they're not married. They are married, and that's what they're, they're married, but she's saying, if you were my brother, you know, like my sibling, I could come running out to you in front of everybody and go, oh, you're here, and I could fling myself and grab you and hold you, and nobody would go, look at, ooh, what's wrong with her? They would say, oh, that's her brother. She hasn't seen him for a long time. And so she says, we, we have to be, oh, we have to be like, I don't know, walk side by side. We gotta, when people see us, we gotta be, what would you explain that as? You gotta be old? Proper? Proper? Using self-control. Self PDA issues. I went, Diane, I was at Golden Valley Lutheran. Hey! hey. Yeah. I was at Golden Valley Lutheran, and my, it was a parent's day. It was in the spring. Mom and dad came. They happened to show up. There was before planting and stuff. So they were there. And so we had a couple of things there. And in the middle of Golden Valley campus is a little pond. And around that pond is a sidewalk. And so my parents were there. I had to do some things and came back. And I had some friends came and said, did you see that old couple? What old couple? There's an old couple walking around the pond holding hands. And I looked at them and they're my parents. <laughs> And so I said, that's my mom and dad. Really? Wow. Are they newlyweds? No. And then they begin to say, you know what? I can't remember the last time my mom and dad held hands. And then they begin to say, you know what? I don't think I've ever seen dad kiss mom. And all of a sudden they start saying all those issues of the, that never happens. Like, well, we know they had sex once because I'm born. But otherwise, I don't think they ever touched each other. That was my mom and dad. And they held hands through all their 57 years of marriage. And my dad got in trouble sometimes when he touched my mom. Don, not here. <laughs> They're married. They're married. I don't know what the PDA is at that time, but they were afraid or ashamed to display their love or to show that they had affection for one another. Then verse 5 shows up. We think it's probably somebody in there who says, who's, it says, who is coming up from the wilderness leaning on her beloved? We don't know who's saying it. It's neither one of the, it's not the woman or the guy. We've changed places. Um, and, and then there's a statement, under the apple tree, I, I awakened you. There your mother was in labor with you. There she who bore you was in labor. Um, kind of in the midst of, huh? So the same word, the word there for awaken is aroused. Under the apple tree, I aroused you. There your mother was in labor. The same word is also translated conceived. You can be in labor or conception. I think those are two different things, but there was the same word. And so it, in some sense in there, it says, who's coming in the wilderness leaning on her beloved? And she responds, while under the apple tree... I aroused you there where your mother conceived you. She who labored over you was conceived in this place. 
Just leaving it there. Don't know why it's there. The hint is in she's hoping to be pregnant. And then verse 6 and 7 explains how powerful love is. All the way through she's saying, be careful, don't awaken it, don't awaken it. Verse 6 and 7. Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm. For love is strong as death, jealousy is fierce as the grave. It flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. If a man offered for love all the wealth of his house, he would be utterly despised. What is love? She says, put me as a seal on your heart and your arm, like a, a, a signet ring, put a, a mark. We've been talking about that in, in Bible study or in Sunday school, that signet ring. Put, make it be an etched mark on your heart and on your arm. Meaning, like, let, all my, let all your thoughts, let all your emotions, let all your actions be a response to how much you love me. Let me make a difference in your life and how you live life. That whatever you do, it's like, that's, this is for my bride, my beloved. Love will leave a mark on you. Have you noticed that? The way you think, the way you feel, the things you do. Do you remember trying to buy dumb gifts for your beloved guys? You're going, what would, be, what would be the right thing? What would say the right thing? Would we... I was too cheap to buy flowers, so that wasn't even on the issue. But I heard guys going, no, do I give her a yellow flower? Do I give her a red flower? Do I give her the white flower? Because, I, you know, the women say there's a different colors mean different things, and I don't want to be too... <laughs> now I go, what's on sale? <laughs> that one's nearly dead. Can I buy it for 50 cents? Love will make you think and do crazy stuff because you're thinking of the other. Said, love is stronger than death. How strong is death? Permanent. Permanent. What does it say about love? It's more than permanent. Actually, it's eternal. Isn't it amazing that Paul says, in, says, abide in which three? Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Why? Because love is the only thing that continues on into eternity. You don't need faith, and you don't need hope in eternity. Love is. Love is stronger than death, and death is going to one day, though is, is, is almost impossible to break, it will be broken. Love is stronger than death. Love is more jealous than the grave. Jealousy doesn't seem like that's a good way to put it, but jealousy is also used to describe God's love for his people. He is a jealous God. Not in an evil, negative way, but he, it hurts him to see his kids in the arms of another lover God. It hurts him to see his people in the arms of someone else. Guys, how many of you appreciate your wife being hugged and kissed and whatnot with somebody else? How many of you gals hope that somebody else will hug and kiss your hubby? Doesn't it bring nice tingly feelings all over in you? What does it do? Yeah. <laughs> We're in trouble fast, right? It just it stirs up fast. So like, you get away from him. You get away from her, you. Love stirs that. Don't touch what's not yours. 
And she's just saying love is more jealous than the grave. The grave wants anybody to come by and, and suck them in, saying it, it's, this is stronger. Because when you, when you love someone, you give them your whole being. You give them everything. And, and when that's given totally to somebody, and they take and stomp on it to go after something else, it always hurts. Painfully. Love is like a fire that is unquenchable. He called it the, uh, the flame, the very flame of the Lord. Like, how many times God has been explained like having a flame? We got Moses on Mount Sinai. Multiple times God came as, as, as fire. He wasn't fire, but it was that consuming and consuming fire, but it didn't consume, but it was not extinguished. So that, that, that love is just, it, it's a fire that cannot be quenched in any way. Saying waters, no matter how many waters you have, no matter how many tsunamis come, no matter how much comes there, it cannot quench that fire. It cannot put out those embers. In some sense, it's very really of all the problems in life. Whether you have problem after problem or difficulty after difficulty, trouble and struggles and whatnot, it cannot quench love. And love is not for sale. If a man offered for love all the wealth of his house, he would be utterly despised. You cannot buy love. You cannot. No amount of money can buy it. If it is, it's just a cheap commodity. This is where she's moved. She has moved to becoming one with him. And he with her. And this is their bond, love. It's a seal on both of their heart and arm. It is stronger than death. It is more jealous than the grave. It is unquenchable and it's not for sale. When you share a love like that, There is an amazing peace and comfort and joy and trust and an enjoyment. There's not suspicion. There is great freedom. This kind of love that seems like it's way over the top is the safest and most fulfilling kind of love you'll ever experience. It would have been a good place to put the end. The end. But there's still a few more verses and um, so we're going to just finish the book. I can stop here. Do you want to stop here or we can go finish it up? Stop! <laughs> this is embarrassing. <coughs> this is like a, an added note. Okay, we'll go fast. In some ways, plug your ears. Maybe not. You have a sister, right? Yeah. Yep. You little boys. This, actually, this is you boys. This is for you. Okay, about Lillian. We have a little sister, she has no breast. What shall we do for our sister on the day she is, when she is spoken for? If she is a wall, we will build her on her in a battlement of silver. But if she is a door, we will enclose her with boards of cedar. I think this is the brothers talking. The way one's back in the first chapter. Um, they're saying is that she's too young to get married. Okay, is your sister too young to get married? Yeah, no, yours isn't. Hers is. Theirs is. So they're saying, our sister is too young to get married. But there's one day she's going to be given away. One day she's going to be spoken for. She is going to be married. And we're just doing this. The brothers are committing to her being a virgin. 
They're saying if she is a wall, like there is no access to her, we will build her a battlement of silver. We will decorate her with silver and ornaments and saying she has, she has been, she is pure, she is honorable, she is a woman that has not been with other men, she is a virgin. That's what they're trying to say. This is who she is. Hear this, but if she is a door, meaning that she has been exposed, she has been with other men, we will enclose her, we will nail up the door with boards of cedar. They will get involved in saying, you sh for her dignity and respect and for her self-worth and what, whatever, they are saying, we will stand between her and other guys and say, no. We want to protect our sister. We are not going to let her go and do whatever she wanted. We take on the responsibility of protecting our sister. She gets to respond. Verse 10. I was like a wall. I am a virgin. And my breasts are like towers. Not saying anything. She's what she's saying is, I am mature and ready for marriage. And when I was in his eyes as one who finds peace. I am a virgin. I am ready to be married. And together we find peace. We find contentment. We will be satisfied in each other. So much so that she goes down to there, kind of reminiscing with Solomon that has, a, has all his wives, and he has others that are taking care of him. She says in verse 12, My vineyard, my vineyard, my body, my very own is before me. She's saying that, and Solomon, you have all your others, you're taking care of them. I am my own. In verse 13, And you who dwell in the gardens with companions, listen to, to for your voice. Let me hear it. In verse 14, she says, Make haste, my beloved. My vineyard is my own. My body is my own. I have kept it separate from my spouse, from my husband. And I'm saying to him, Make haste, my beloved. Come and be like a gazelle or a young stag on the mountain of spices. Let no obstacle stop you. Let nothing stop you. Come. I am yours. It is... An invitation for him to come and to be with her. And that's the end of the book. So, a couple of things. Unconditional love for husband and wife is a lifetime of life together. So be together. God has put the two of you together, husbands and wife, He has put you together. It is the most amazing person in your life, is your spouse. Not your kids, not your grandkids, not the neighbor's kids. The most amazing person in your life is your spouse. God's given gift to you. He formed her, he formed him in, your mother, in their mother's womb just for you. Love him, love her with everything you got. Let the description of love, that it is, it is as stronger than the grave, that it is jealous, or jealous as the grave, that is stronger than death, that is unquenchable and unboughten, let that be your description of how you love God. Your hubby.
children. Our children need to know what good touch is, what playful touch is, what it is that moms and dads together it's good to do. We're in a culture where there is so much of unhealthy touch. And, and, and touch can be lumped into being everything. <coughs> get away and do some PDA in public. Walk in the mall, hold the hands. Find a lake, walk around it, hold it, and give a kiss. You can sit by each other. I know in church it's hard. I know you have to walk the kids in between the two of you. Please, please, do good touch. And a constant reminder to each other, you are my darling. You are my beloved. Over and over throughout this hymn, throughout this song, it's been, you need to tell your husband, you are my beloved. You are my one and only. You need to tell your wifey, you are my darling. You are my beautiful one. You are the apple of my eye. I don't think we ever get tired of hearing that. For Christ in the church, what does this look like for us? I just want you to know that Jesus loves us very, very much. In fact, I just want you to know, as she said, put me as a signet on your, on your heart and your arms. Jesus has already done that. He has already got you in, on his heart and his, and his arm in his hands and in his feet of how much he loves you. The marks are there. He, he sees it every day. He, he looks at it and he reminds me, that's why I love. This is whom I love. You are on his heart and you are on all his actions. He loves you very, very much. Meaning us as a body of believers. He loves us. There is no obstacle that he will not overcome coming to us or to you. There is no shame, there is no guilt, there is nothing that you have ever done that keeps him away. There is no mountain that's high enough or there any valley that's low enough that he goes, nah, I ain't doing that one. There's nothing you've ever done in your life that Jesus says, ooh, got to stay away from this one. There is no obstacle that you, that he will not overcome to be near you. In fact, he will extend his hand and say, grab a hold. Grab a hold of my hand and let's do this together. There is nothing. There is nothing to stop him. He wants to be with you because he loves you so very much. And here's a challenge for us. Let's try to be kind to Jesus and say thank you. Most of the time when we talk with Jesus or with our Father, we have a whole long list of fix-its, right? Could you please fix this? 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 How many of you like to be called all the time just to fix things? But the only time you get a call is that there's something broken and you need to fix it. I'm going to say Jesus is kind of the same way. He loves it when you give him a call and say, hey, thank you. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for what you are doing. Thank you for what you will do. Thank you for the blessing in my life. Thank you for putting me in this valley right now because now I'm learning to lean into you. Thank you for the obstacles I'm going through. Thank you that you came to me. Thank you 
that you've promised to be with me and will not forsake me. I want to, I want to encourage you. Jesus loves you way more than what we can imagine or think. There's nothing that he won't overcome to get to you. For us to just respond and say, thank you. Thank you. And that's it. Any thoughts or questions on the book of Song of Songs? We did not cover everything. Don. It is, it is very good. Mm hmm. Yeah. All right. Let's pray. Gracious God, I just thank you. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your amazing love letter called the Bible and the amazing love letter in the Song of Songs. Father, I, I thank you for the challenges that the book brings before us as, as a married couple or as those who are dating or those who are single. For some things we have something to look forward to, other things we can remember past. Some of those things we are reminded of what we missed and wished that if we had a chance we would do it over again. I thank you. I thank you for our spouse. And thank you for the, thank you for the beautiful bride and the handsome men that you put together. Father, help us to, to love with such fierce love the one whom you have given to us. I also pray uh, for us as a body of believers, as the bride of Christ, to have that kind of desire for Jesus. That it, we know it hurts his heart when we're not with him. I would ask that it would also hurt our heart when we're not with him. That, that we would want to be near him. And that when he calls, that there's a flutter in our heart and there's a desire to, to be near. And, and there is something about being with him that just, it makes us go a little crazy. Help us. Help us to embrace that we are the bride of Christ. Greatly loved. Fiercely loved who is getting ready for an amazing day of eternity. Bless my brothers and sisters with more of your spirit and more of Jesus. I pray this in his name. Amen.